Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti. Welcome, welcome back to Casa Italiana Zerini Marimò. Uh, this evening is a very special evening. Uh, we celebrate uh, really a huge accomplishment uh, of Michael Moore, who, as many of you know, is an alumnus of our doctoral program in Italian literature here at New York University. We couldn't be more proud than him, especially on this occasion when he's helping bring the quintessential Italian novel to the American public in their language. So for us, it's a reason of, of joy and celebration. So in the past few years, every time I, I met Michael, and that happens quite often, fortunately, I would ask him this, the state of, the, of affairs and the progress, and he would give me a quite update uh, uh, situation of, of, of things. And when the news arrived that the book was finally ready and was hitting the bookstores, um, we decided not to have only a presentation, that would be limiting. So we have a whole Manzoneide or a Manzoni More Marathon that is going to last for the entire semester. Um, you saw for up upstairs that there is an exhibit uh, that is connected to this uh, translation of Ipromessis Posi, and we are going to tell you something with the photographer and the curator at the end of the presentation with Michael. I'm just going to tell you a few things also that are going to happen. Uh, in these months uh, regarding um, Manzoni Promessi Sposi. So we have today the book presentation, the inauguration of the exhibit. Um, on October 25th, we're going to have Laughing with Manzoni, parodies of the betrothed. I will never be able to pronounce this word. <laughs> never, ever. Michael has tried many times. He didn't succeed. <laughs> Nobody will. Um, and it's going to be um, comics, uh, TV, and other parodies of the, of, the, mm, of the novel. Then we're gonna have the great fiction on stage, so how Italian theater transformed novel into uh, theatrical performances. Then on November 22nd, we're gonna have Electio Magistralis by Andrea Ciccarelli that will help us understand the role of Manzoni in Italian culture, it, the non-role until here of Manzoni in American culture. Um, on November 28th, we're gonna have a panel on the Catholic novel, as you know, one of the reasons, apparently, that Manzoni is not really as known in the US as he could be is a sort of a, a anti-Catholic prejudice. So what is a Catholic novel? Is it enough for a writer to be Catholic, to define his, a novel Catholic? So we have a terrific panel with uh, Antonio Monda, Paul Eli, and Antonio Spadaro, who is the editor-in-chief of Civiltà Cattolica. And then on December 9th, we're gonna close this Manzoni extravaganza with a screening of a 1922 film of I Promessi Sposi, one of the many cinematographic versions. Uh, but the great thing is that we commissioned, especially to celebrate Michael's translation, a soundtrack that is gonna be performed live here on the stage um, to artist Art Hirara, who is a jazz musician, but also that does uh, interesting contaminations of other musical genres. We are very curious to see what he will prepare for, uh, to accompany the silent movie that is not gonna long, uh, be silent anymore of you promise his posi. <laughs> All these things are gonna be on our website so you don't need to memorize the dates and what happened, just to give you a sense that for us, this is really a central point in our, in our mission uh, this year. And um, Michael Moore, very briefly, because you can find his biography uh, and uh, bibliography uh, on our website and in many other sources, uh, Michael is a very established translator from Italian into English, uh, translated um, Moravia, many other authors, Levi, Primo Levi, and uh, uh, Manzoni really is the big project, a project almost of a lifetime. How many years, Michael? Ten? I, I say ten, just because it's a nice round number, yeah. but it's a little longer than that. Yeah. And many of you probably are familiar with Michael in his other role, uh, that is interpreter. He was for many years the chief interpreter uh, of the Italian mission at the United Nations. And in that role, he made sound more intelligent than they are our, <laughs> prime, our prime ministers and presidents and minister of foreign affairs. That was his job, to take what they brought in like sort of somehow Italian, and he made it into beautiful English. And you might have heard him many, many times at Lincoln Center and many other places. He uh, is the English voice of all the Italian film directors. So all these experiences come together uh, with, with Michael, and his sense of humor is extraordinary, and you will probably recognize it also in the translation 
uh, of the uh, Vipo Messi Sposi, and we are delighted to have him here to celebrate his accomplishment. Please welcome. <laughs> Since we celebrate the publication of a translation, uh, I think we should start by listening to, uh, to a part, to the beginning, mm -hmm. how it all started, with Ramo del Lago di Como. And to help us with that, uh, Michael has invited uh, his friend, actor Demosthenes Crisan, and he will read for us three passages. So now we start with the very beginning of the novel. Demosthenes, please. The branch of Lake Como that turns south between two unbroken mountain chains, bordered by coves and inlets that echo the furrowed slopes, suddenly narrows to take the flow and shape of a river between a promontory on the right and a wide shoreline on the opposite side. The bridge that joins the two sides at this point seems to make this transformation even more visible to the eye and mark the spot where the lake ends and the Ara begins Again, to reclaim the name lake, where the shores, newly distant, allow the water to spread and slowly pool into fresh inlets and coves. From, formed from the sediment of three large streams, the shore lies at the foot of two neighboring mountains, the first called San Martino, the second, in Lombard dialect, the Rezegone, the Big Saw after the row of many small peaks that really do make it look like one. So clear is the resemblance that no one, provided they are directly facing it, from the northern walls of Milan, for example, could fail to immediately distinguish this summit from other mountains in that long and vast range with more obscure names and more common shapes. For a good stretch, the shores rise, rises above, upward into a smooth rolling slope. Then it breaks off into small hills and ravines, steep inclines and flat terraces, molded by the contours of the two mountains and the erosion of the waters. The water's edge, cut by the outlets of the streams, is almost all pebbles and stones. The rest is fields and vineyards, dotted with towns, villages, and hamlets. Thank you. Che bello. And I know that you have a problem with De Bello. And as you know, many uh, Italian literature professors for many years, people that somehow adopted the, uh, the um, uh, aesthetic ideas of Benedetto Croce, there was the estetica del che bello. So if something sounds really good, to your, it sounds nice to your ears, just say che bello and there is nothing else you can add. So literary criticism had a very, very limited function. Michael had a personal battle against the bello uh, when he was teaching English in Italian high schools. He prohibited the use bello to his students <laughs> in, a, in his typical anti-Crocean way. But really, this is beautiful prose uh, in English. What was your aim when you translated? First of all, who made you do this? How you decided to, to translate he promised his posy. What was your... That, was, that reminds me of the questions we used to get in the old Baltimore Catechism. Who made you? God made you. Um. <laughs> the, the good point about that was that the answers were short and clear. Yes, yeah, yeah. enough for a first grader to, to memorize. I, I already forgot the answers, though. <laughs> um, but I think, um, in a way, it, it is kind of a summary of everything that I've done. Uh, certainly, everything that I've learned is here. Uh, when the book finally arrived, you know, um, I wanted the publisher to send it to various people who could influence it, review it, and I was the last to get it. <laughs> and, and when I got it, they messengered it over right away, and I felt like I was holding my life in my hands, you know. <laughs> Ten years, you know, is a round number, but that was when I was most intensely dedicated to it. I think um, when you're a translator, um, when you're doing what I did, a PhD in Italian, you're sort of pursuing it's very irrational, so it's sort of hard to come up with 
I mean, because if I were a rational person, I wouldn't be doing something <laughs> like this, right? And I wouldn't have gotten a PhD in Italian, and I wouldn't have gone to Italy, and I wouldn't have lived the life that I've lived. It wasn't a series of rational decisions. It's a series of impulses, maybe, of feeling what is important and what matters. And I think, um, you know, with all these years of dedication to the Italian language, Italian literature, Italian culture, um, I felt like this was there, you know, that this was, uh, there's sort of a vocation to explain Italy to Americans, really, to make them see what you see, perhaps, make them share something that you share. And this was one of those mysteries. Um, it was, in a way, it was almost a, a thank you. I lived in Milan, I lived in Como, and they always felt that, you know, that they felt misunderstood. Italians often feel misunderstood abroad, right? No one understands us, right? And, and this is one of the great misunderstandings. This is this novel that is universally known in Italy and unknown outside of it. And I'd always felt it, as Manzoni himself says in the introduction, that it is a beautiful story, you know, like using that word bello, which I had prohibited, not because I dislike it, but because there are so many other you know, adjectives in the language, and I wanted my students to use a few more of them than just that one. And I thought that there was great beauty in it, and I used to, when Italians would say, well, why do you think it's not better known? And they had all these reasons regarding the plot and theology, and I said, no. The previous translations are just really flat. And, um, and I was doubting whether to do it, and I talked to a, a close friend, Edie Gro Grossman, who translated uh, uh, you know, among many contemporary Latin American writers, including Garcia Marquez, uh, Don Quixote. And she said, well, just try the first page and see how it feels. And I did. And that's how it felt. And that's how it felt, yes. You know, and this is the first time I'm hearing it in English. Uh, it's very moving, you know, to see your words t taken away from you, actually, and to hear them in someone else's mouth. So. Michael, what do you think um, reading the novel in English will teach Americans about Italy and Italians that they don't know already? Lots. Because um, uh, Americans don't know Italy as well as they think they do, first of all. You know, I mean, every American comes back, they're an expert, right? And they've got some new kind of pasta that they want you to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, they make me feel so ignorant, you know. Um, I think that there's, um, it, t it tells you a lot about village life. I think there are things that they will recognize in terms of small town life and gossips and good and evil. Um, I don't think that they will realize it, the, a lot of, about Italian history, um, a lot about how Italy was occupied, Italy was a colony. Um, the historical background to what is happening inside the novel is terrifying. I mean, there, northern Italy becomes this battleground between France and Spain. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't even say the word sometimes, Holy Roman Empire, because actually one of the nuns I had in sixth grade said it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, <laughs> right? Um, you know, but basically the imperial troops of the Austro-Hungarian Empire even entered in, bringing with them the plague. So there's this great sweep of Italian history. There's the language um, there's a lot of wisdom, too. Um, and there's something essential, I think, about the Italian character. I know that many Italians see themselves reflected. Some say that this novel created the Italian character in the sense that when he was writing it, Italy didn't exist and Italian didn't really exist. And he's trying to capture something essential, which is so this- Archetypes. Archetypes and also a sense of moderation. He's terrified of crowds. This is a man who, in the span of his lifetime, sees the French Revolution, you know, which then becomes the reign of terror, which then leads to Napoleon, who he had very high regard for, um, and the revolutions leading up to Italian independence, not until later in his life with the Risorgimento. So he's really seen that momentous uh, and difficult century of the 19th century, and I think that's still deeply embedded in Italians today. Michael, one thing you did, you asked, contemporary Italian writers yes. to tell you the character in the Promises of Apology they identified with. Yes. Any surprise? Um, well, the more surprise recently, uh, I think um, I was, um, I did a conversation at Rizzoli Bookstore with uh, Andre Asaman, and he was very fond of Lucia, and no, Donna Bondio, who was the last person I would have expected someone to admire, because He's not really a bad guy, but he's so feckless that his lack of courage sort of leads to a whole series uh, of tragedies, you know? Um, 
and it's funny, I remember when the scandal came out of uh, American telegrams talking about Italy, mm -hmm. which was the first time I saw the adjective feckless, and it really made me admire American diplomats that had that command of, of vocabulary, first of all, because this was also the time of Berlusconi who was accused of being feckless, but Donabondo is definitely feckless, and he gets chewed out toward the end of the novel for his lack of courage, saying he should have been ready to be a martyr. So that was a big surprise to me. Others, uh, like the courageous figure, you know, Padre Cristoforo, for example, you know. Um, who is your favorite character? Renzo, you know, who... Why? You know, the Italians don't like him for some reason, but Renzo, there he is, he's so enterprising. You know, he's an orphan, but somehow he builds a small, you know, property he for himself. He has a vineyard. Do I remember correctly, you said that He's the most American of these He's definitely the most American. He builds a life. He's always trying to self you know, improvise. Like Self-made, trying to improvise a solution. Maybe he makes a mistake, but then there is room to recover. It's, that's the way we live in America. You know, We make mistakes, we go on. Maybe we fight with everyone in town, we move someplace else, right? <laughs> you know? uh, you know? Whereas in Italy, you, know, you have a fight, and there you are with your neighbors for Stuck. several generations. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Michael, uh, one other thing that is peculiar of Manzoni is the plurality of styles. Actually, some critics accused him of having all the characters speak the same language without mm -hmm. differences. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, did you find that true? And the other thing is, are there different registers, are there different linguistic uh, spectrums that uh, he uses? Mm -hmm. And how does he do that? It's funny, all while I translated the novel. You know, if you ever go to like the Bope's library to the Italian floor, there's a whole wall of books about Manzoni. Uh, it's intimidating. I mean, if I were have done, have done the research on Manzoni, like to do a dissertation, I would never have been able to do this. So I was constantly imagining like a little Italian professor standing on my shoulder, <laughs> like you see in the cartoons, saying, uh-uh, you got that wrong. Oh, you don't understand a thing. Capis <laughs> da you know, as they would say up in the north. Um, but now, now that it's done, and it's really now that I'm starting to talk in public, I'm kind of overcoming my uncertainties. And I'm ready to take them on, um, the Italian critics, um, because they're wrong about so many things. Um, they're wrong about La Divina Providenza, which they're always going on about. And they're certainly- Let's say something about this. Yeah. You know, one of the, the typical questions you would get when you take your final high school exam is, who is the protagonist of the betrothed? The wrong answer is any name of a character. You need to come up with something better, okay? And it could be the century, the 17th century. It could be divine providence. Mm -hmm. uh, and you seem to object to that. Compl I mean, when I started translating, I was looking for a good commentary, just you know, to give me basic information, to paraphrase things that didn't make sense, to give definitions of words. And all I found in commentaries were these little homilies which were exactly the kind of thing the school children were supposed to answer. Um, and what I would say about the language uh, is that they're dead wrong. I mean, I, I had the, called the good fortune. It wasn't fortune, it was, uh, oh, well, whatever we mean by fortune, right? Um, it wasn't riches, that I lived in Lombardia, in Lombardy, and I could hear in those peasants those voices. There's like this Griso, who, like, who is the henchman, you know, of Don Rodrigo, and he says, Le Duda. You know, and I could hear that voice that I used to hear in Como. You know, that's the way they would talk. The mothers would come for the you know meeting with the teacher of me, and they would say, "Come va la tuza." You know, I mean, there were those <laughs> deep accents. There's a lot of that. So there was great variety in speech, and he's constantly. He it was difficult to translate for many reasons, but especially because sometimes if you're working on a single book with a single author, you get into a groove. You know their vocabulary, and you cruise along, right? It was never that way with him. He would start to write in a certain way, and he has that sense of, then he would feel like maybe he's gone too far. And of course, he's revising constantly himself as he rewrote the novel again and again, and then he'll switch into another mode. So he begins with his parody of 17th century Italian, and he's always making fun of the 17th century, of the ignorance of the books, of especially of this Hispanized Italian that they would use. Pompous and... Pompous and Baroque, and this use of... Uh, the very beginning is an introduction where there's, there's all of these conceits regarding the stars and the moon and the Spanish king and stuff. And then he suddenly says, stop, enough. And then he speaks in his voice. And then he gets more contemplative. 
And then he begins with that beautiful passage that Demosthenes had, you know, wrote. And, and then from there, he, then he starts quoting from different historical documents. And then he gets into the story itself, and maybe Demosthenes could read where the action yeah. finally starts. Thank you. <coughs> Which is, just to back you up, the character, Don Abondio, the parish priest, is just walking along, minding his business. Along one of these footpaths, on the evening of the seventh day of November in 1628, Don Abondio, the parish priest of one of the villages just mentioned, was making his way home from a leisurely walk. He was calmly reciting the divine office. Occasionally, between one psalm and another, he would close his breviary, keeping his right index finger inside as a bookmark. Clasping his hands together behind his back, he would continue his walk, staring at the ground and kicking toward the wall any stones that got in the way. Then he would look up, let his eyes wander idly, and gaze at the wide and uneven splashes of purple on the cliffs, painted there by the light of the setting sun that had peeked through crevices in the mountain on the opposite shore. After opening his breviary again and reciting another passage, he came to a curve in the path where it was always his custom to look up from his book and stare straight ahead. Today was no different. Past the curve, the road continued straight for another 60 steps or so and then split into two lanes in a Y shape. The path to the right went up to the mountains and toward the rectory. The one to the left went down to the valley as far as a stream. On that side, the wall was only waist high. As he turned the corner and directed his gaze, as usual, towards the shrine, the priest noticed something unexpected that he would rather not have seen. Two men were facing each other at the spot where the two lanes meet. The first was sitting astride the low wall, one leg dangling on the outside and one foot planted on the ground. His companion stood leaning against the opposite wall, arms folded over his chest. Their clothing, demeanor, and expression, or what little the priest could discern from the distance, left little doubt as to the station, their station in life. At a glance, you could see they were letting themselves be known as bravi. It was all too clear that the two men were waiting for someone. But what was most displeased Don Abondio was the forced realization from certain gestures that the someone they were waiting for was him. Because as soon as he appeared, they exchanged glances and raised their heads as if they had both just said, it's him. The sitting man stood up lowering his leg to the path. His partner peeled himself off the wall. Both started moving toward him, keeping his breviary open in front of him as if he was reading. Don, Don Abondio forced himself to look up to keep an eye on their movements. Seeing them advance toward him, he was suddenly assailed by a thousand thoughts. He quickly asked himself whether between the Bravi and himself there was not perhaps some way out to the right or left. Just as quickly he remembered there was none. He did a rapid self-examination, wondering whether he had offended some powerful man, some vindictive. But even in the midst of this, his agitation, he was somewhat reassured by, his, by the consoling testimony of his conscience. Still, the bravi approached, staring straight at him. He placed the index and middle fingers of his left hand inside his collar as to adjust it. And while the two fingers circled his neck, he turned his head to look back at the same time as he twisted his mouth into a grimace. From the corner of his eye, he tried to see as far as he could whether, as far as he could whether someone else was coming, but he saw no one. He stole a peek over the low, and wall, low wall toward the fields. No one. A cowering glance at the road ahead no one except the bravi. What was he to do? Turn back? Too late. Take to his heels? He might as well have say, come and get me, or worse. Unable to avoid the danger, he rushed into it, since the uncertainty was so painful that all he wanted was to get it over with. He quickened his step, recited a verse in a louder voice, 
settled his face into as calm and cheerful an expression as he could manage and made every effort to prepare a smile. Once he found himself before the two upright citizens, he said to himself, here we go, and stopped in his tracks. Reverend Father, said one of the two staring him in the face. At your service, Don Abundio immediately replied, looking up from his book, which remained open in his hands as if resting on a lectern. Is it your intention, the second man continued with the angry, menacing look of someone who, was, who has caught an underling in the act of doing some mischief, is it your intention to marry Renzo Tramaglino and Lucia Mondella tomorrow? Beg your pardon, replied Don Abondio, his voice shaking. Beg your pardon, good sirs, you are men of the world. You know perfectly well how these matters go. The poor priest has nothing to do with it. Young people make a mess of things and then, and then they come to us the way you would go to a bank for money. And we, we are servants of the common good. Well then, Bravo said in his ear, but in the solemn no tone of a command, this marriage ain't gonna happen. Not tomorrow, not never. These two passages beautifully read by Demosthenes, uh, we have a, a sense of the variety of languages. So the first one is a description, and maybe something that has not been said enough is that Manzoni is a writer that is deeply in touch with nature, with the environment. Uh, he's, a, he's a writer of characters. He's great in outlining uh, the psychology of people, but he's also a great author of nature. And I think the exhibit upstairs actually catches some of that, the, 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 uh, this symphony that, that he felt with, with the environment. So the first one was a proof of that. And this one is a dialogue, is an encounter. There are lots of encounters in, in uh, and one of the elements in these encounters is, is almost always irony. And uh, some, some of these encounters are ironic, some are dramatic, and some are funny. And you were telling me that you laughed reading and rereading uh, the Promises Posse. And that is something that probably also Italians tend to forget, that this is also a novel that will make you laugh. How is Manzoni as a, not comic author, but uh, as a uh, author that is able to um, create comic situations without humiliating uh, the subject of, 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 the, of the matter? I kinda, he often plays the puppet master, you know? He is, he's, you know, he's doing the voices of all the characters, of course, because he's the writer, but then he takes a step back and he sort of observes them and comments on them, and he, he's a wonderful creator of, I don't want to say caricatures, because he's better than that, but you know, in two or three words, boom, he just gives you the whole picture of someone. He creates characters just as memorably, if not more so, than Dickens does, you know, and Dickens was certainly one of my inspirations in, in translating this, just in terms of finding the right English to use. Um, and he's very ironic, you know, about things. I think even when he starts He's, on the one hand, you know, he's sort of horrified and protesting the Spanish occupation of Milan um, because this has led to, you know, this war being fought in Mantua. It leads to a famine. Um, people's livelihoods are being threatened. Things are being stolen. And he just says at the very beginning, you know, and the soldiers would give a tap on the back to some of the men, meaning that they would beat them bloody and help the peasants thin the vines, meaning that they would steal the harvest. So, you know, he, he has a lightness of touch, which people don't always appreciate. And I suppose if you're reading him for an exam, it might be kind of hard to appreciate that side to him. You know? A sense of humor. A sense of humor. And always he breaks things up. <laughs> Almost always. There are exceptions, you know. But he knows when it's time to change his tune. Some object to the digressions. I love the digressions in Manzoni, with only maybe one exception. Um, but I'm seeing of course, I'm going to ask you about it. Yeah. Uh, but Michael, which were the parts that were more difficult for you to translate, or more boring, or more heavy? Yeah. And the, the parts that were more uh, exhilarating and yeah. energizing? Um, I mean, I, I really enjoyed, in terms of the, let me go positive first, you know. I mean, in the old women talking to each other, I kept imagining my grandmother. 
And, um, you know, I was raised in a Catholic family, and we were never supposed to take the, you know, the Lord's name in vain. Um, and I'll never forget walking in on my grandmother once, and she said, glory be to St. Peter. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I would imagine that language, you know, the language of, you know, of my aunts rather than really my own mother. Um, there's other characters, Fragaldino. Even when I read him aloud, he tells this story. He goes around um, gathering chestnuts as an offering to the monastery. And I imagine him as Irish for some reason. And when I start <laughs> reading him, he comes out Irish, you know? Um, so I really enjoyed the, the character portrayals. Um, I think the hardest part, and I don't know whether that was because of me, maybe because of this religious education, having had too much of it, so that when I got to college in philosophy and they instantly started talking about body versus soul, I was just like, not that again. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> my brain just shuts down, you know? And I think that, you know, sort of in the middle of the, of the 20s, you know, suddenly in comes Cardinal Borromeo, who there Manzoni is less ironic than he is with, and he gets a little bit out of control there. It's a dead moment in the plot. He goes on forever. Um, and that's actually where Dona Bonjo did become sort of sympathetic to me because there, first of all, you get the whole story of Borromeo, you know, of how he became a cardinal and how he built this library and how great he was, okay. You know, but without any of the kind of psychological background that you had for and some of the other And then come characters. the homilies by Borromeo. Yes, and then, then he chews out Dona Bongio for not doing this marriage. And for once, you know, I f totally identify with Dona Bongio because he's like, easy for you to say. He says, I was the one looking at those two bravi in the face, you know? Who would have defended me? And there is Don, uh, you know, there's Borromeo saying, you should have been willing to be a martyr because if you're going to be a priest. And he's like, really? I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 it's just kind of, it's a lot to ask. You know? Were you tempted to skip some parts? Uh, I think I might in have done that. In the New York, by no, the way, what the reviews yeah. are raving yeah. from every corner. And the one in the um, New Yorker yeah. starts by saying, translators that deliberately decided yeah. to, were you ever tempted? Um, there were Would parts have you that I left, left to the out end. Borromeo? There were things that I left to the end, um, so I think I did leave Borromeo to the end. Uh, the Gride, these decrees, I left till the end. Because but that's a huge difficulty from a linguistic yes, point of view. Yeah, and, and also just to, I mean, what the heck is he talking about? I mean, it was like written, it, they were actual documents written in legal and Italian legalese even today. I mean, I have worked, I, when I said that this is kind of a summation of the work that I've done, my work at the Italian mission was very frequently working closely with a legal advisor and having to translate Italian legal documents and to explain the Italian legal system. And even, I don't know if you recall the whole Amanda Knox story, which the Americans never got, boy, she got off. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I mean, the fact that this trial would go from one area to the next, to the next, to the next, and the way it would be spread out on the trial of the first instance and the second instance and the Assize, I mean, it's a very, very um, Baroque system. So I think um, getting to the, and Manzoni was quoting the parts that were the most ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's not just documentary, it's making fun of those laws and how ineffective they were. It's political satire. Yeah. The yeah. Grida, he takes the document, mm -hmm. and by taking the document and reproducing them verbatim, mm -hmm. he's provided the most effective political satire against the Spanish government yeah. that was ruling. Uh, yeah, so I, I was very lucky to be working closely with a legal advisor to the mission, and he explained, and he had studied um, the legislation, uh, or one of his professors had written a whole book about the legislation in Italy during the bubonic plague of 1630. And so he had actually studied all of these documents and stuff. So he was able to explain in plain Italian what they meant, and so I did it in plain English, and then I messed it up to make it as, as garbled, you know, um, as they were in. The so, the three ways the process: yeah. unravel, yeah. translation, and re -ravel. Re -ravel it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And actually, one of, you know, I mean, when Italians talk to me about divine providence, I always say the word only occurs providenza something like four times. You know, um, once a famous Italian poet told me Americans couldn't understand, um, you know. Uh, I promised he supposed it because they didn't know what divina providenza meant. And I said, I grew up right outside of providence. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are you talking about? Um, I know the ins and outs of providence. <laughs> I know the ins and outs. 
The word that he uses most frequently is confusione. And the thing that he does most brilliantly as a writer, that is most original, uh, most innovative among the Western no of the 19th century novelists is the way that he describes the crowd, the way he describes chaos. Mm -hmm. And there I had to have quite a battle with my editors because there Manzoni, who's talking about everything in the past, suddenly uses the present tense and suddenly starts using more jagged syntax. I kept it in the present, first the editor, then the copy editor, then the proofreader, they were all saying, no, 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 inconsistency of tense. I'm like, sorry, this is the way he did it. When Manzoni says, così va il mondo, mm -hmm. or better, così andava. Yeah, yeah. So, so he gives a, a critique of his own time, yeah. pretending to provide the critique of the yeah, 17th century. Because he had witnessed, he had witnessed some, I mean, because, actually, you know, uh, Visconti was going to make a film of the novel. After doing Senso, they lost a m lot of money on that, and for some reason they thought they'd make money on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> go figure. And there is a screenplay, I think, that Bassani wrote. It's quite remarkable when you think of the people collaborating with Italian cinema in those years. And Manzoni said it's not really a novel of individual people, it's a novel of groups, of collectives. And so he would have done two films. The first, about the bread riots, which is what happens around the famine when Renzo arrives in Milano the first time. And the second part would have been about the plague, which is when uh, Renzo returns to Milano in order to um, rescue Lucia. And there's a very memorable moment when I was talking about how Manzoni is so much at the root of Italian writing. Primo Levi quotes directly and indirectly Manzoni many times. I mean, I think clearly when Manzoni is talking about where the plague victims were taken, the Lazzaretto, um, Manzoni himself sort of draws on Dante and these sort of grotesque figures. Mm -hmm. But when Primo Levi is talking about Auschwitz, there are these, sh he's often drawing on Manzoni for that language. But there is one essay that he dedicates to Manzoni where he's talking about Renzo. Maybe Renzo was his favorite character too, I don't know. But when Renzo, in order to escape a crowd that thinks he is spreading the plague, jumps up on one of the death carts you know, which is filled with dead bodies and these monati, these ghoulish characters who are in charge of taking away the dying and the dead and uh, waves his fist at them. You know, it's quite a, a grotesque scene. You know? Michael, and what about the female characters? Your cover yeah. has two portraits repeated in a serial way, sort of making them more pop, yeah. uh, but it's the, the original uh, illustrations that yeah. Manzoni ordered to Francesco Maria Gonin. Yeah. And uh, is it a, a chance that it's called the betrothed and then you have a nun and a girl? I mean... Who is betrothed to whom there? <laughs> it's funny, I... Is it gender fluidity, Manzoni? Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I love the cover. Um, we, did a lot of, we did a lot of discussion about it <laughs> and that's where I discovered, you know, that Visconti was gonna make a movie. He was even, then it, it came down to just this one story, The Nun of Monza, which is a remarkable portrait of a woman. And I think one of, of the many innovations in Manzoni is the way he describes women and their inner lives. And, and the extent- And Visconti casted Sophia Loren for the He Margaret. wanted Sophia Loren and they he did some it, photography. Yeah. She thought it would be bad, bad for her career to be portraying a sinful nun. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, but there's some remark, I had actually, you know, shown them the picture of Sophia Loren as a nun, you know, when we were doing sort of research. And I sent them a bunch of the uh, engravings from the original that gone in that Manzoni in this edition, uh, some say it was to prevent piracy. I think it was to make it a popular, I always say, and this is where I appropriated it from the Italians, you know, um, it's supposed to be a popular novel. And I think the Italian scholastic tradition has sort of buried it instead in all kinds of ecclesiastical stuff and all kinds of dust and detritus. And I feel like I'm trying to just lift that off and to let it breathe and to be a popular novel again. Tell us more about the women. So as, as for the women, I mean, there's Lucia, who I sort of call the human pincushion, um, <laughs> because this was um, this elaborate headgear that she wore for her wedding day. And so, and when she appears, you know, the, on the page where, you know, Renzo goes to give her the bad news that they can't get married, she comes out in this. Uh, and there she is, this sort of quiet soul. She, in a way, I think she's almost like a blank canvas because so many Italians project a lot of things onto her. And I think it's, I think I had to have my interpretation of the novel to do it. 
but I had to interpret it, in, uh, but I had to leave it open to other people's interpretations. I didn't want to be too heavy handed. And uh, Lucia has a remarkable inner life um, and she does somehow get her way. She's very deeply spiritual. Um, um, and it's sort of interesting the cover that there she is with her eyes closed, which I think is also quite appropriate. The nun of Monza is this, I say this poor girl because she is forced into the convent and, and it is such a portrait of coercion. It's terrifying that this woman has absolutely no choice. Now, sometimes I think of how distant that and how remote that concept is from Americans, from American students. I mean, we are raised with this idea of choice. There is no choice for this girl. Every step of the way when she tries to escape from this destiny, something comes in the way. And the punishments are grueling, including the final punishment of the church, where she is walled in alive in this tiny cell for 18 years, and they just pass the food underneath. I have terrible compassion for her, and I think Manzoni does as well, in the same way maybe that Milton did for Satan, you know. Um, you know. Uh, so I think that, again, another... Michael, how did you translate La Sventurata Rispose? Uh, with the, the whole one. story of the Monica, yeah. of, the, of the forced nun of Mons, uh, she's forced by her family because mm -hmm. it's, it's an aristocratic family, all the patrimony must go to the first male born, and uh, she is the girl, and therefore the only way for her is the convent. So she's forced to become a cloister nun. And uh, she, do she doesn't want to. I mean, it's, it's very clear in her head that she wants to live outside, in the world, enjoy the world. And she gives up to the... Uh, she succumbs. She succumbs <laughs> to the temptation of this young man who lives next to the convent. And Manzoni, in one of his uh, beautiful, uh, extremely synthetic sentences, closes her story, saying, La sventurata rispose. How did you translate that? I went back and forth on that, and it is a question Italians always ask. And when you're translating something to which there's such great attention, you kind of falter a little bit. But then, you know, I got up my courage because... Some of the language he uses, if I were to translate it literally, would just reduce the novel to nonsense. Because La Sventurata could be the wretch. And I just think, you know, amazing grace, a poor wretch mm -hmm. like me. It just sounded like, you know, just too old-fashioned. And I didn't want that. But Sventurata is a particular word. First of all, that sentence occurs in the final version. Because in the earlier version, then he goes on to give lots of details of all the stuff that follows. And said here, it's a cliffhanger, you know? And so it's so literally it's the wretched woman replied, you know, meaning all kinds of things because suddenly you sort of know how this is going to go and it's not going to go well. But a word like aventura is not really an adventure and a word like sventurata is not really the lack of adventure. It means that something fateful is going to happen. And in Italian you can take like an adjective and use it to represent a person, right? Il povero, you know, we wouldn't say the poor because that becomes the poor guy, maybe, then that's too colloquial. Mm -hmm. And to say the wretch, like previous translators do, just uh, made nonsense of the sentence. But I took that concept of fate, it was in that, and I put it toward the end. So I said, and she gave her fateful reply. So I wanted the idea of fate in it, and I also wanted the drama of that sentence, you know, that sort of a cliffhanger that he gives, because you're like, well, what was the reply, you know? And I wanted to leave you hanging with that. And I wanted it to sound good, you know? So. It sounds good. It sounds it good. Does. <laughs> it does. I would go on ask Michael 10,000 questions. But I think if you have questions, if you have anything you're curious about the translation, those of you who have already read it and those of you who are looking forward to read it, I think this is the time. And then we have one more passage from uh, the mm, translation of Michael. And then we're going to say something about the exhibit, and we're going to call our friends for responses. Any question, any comment? Yes. Yeah, uh, one of your characters uh, towards the end of the second reading said, not, never. Yes. Now, why did you make it a double negative? I wanted to, ca you know, in Italian, you know, this is going back to the question earlier you about. Are repeating the question? Yeah. In the microphone? Oh, okay, in the microphone. Yeah. Uh, near the end of the second reading, your character says, not never, a double negative. And I was wondering your reasoning behind that. 
Um, it sort of goes back to the question earlier about how the various peasants speak, mm -hmm. and these are thugs. Um, and, you know, I, I've, first of all, I have to admit, I've always wanted to use the word ain't in a translation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there's that, and I thought it was appropriate, and for most of the gestation of the translation, I mean, uh, my house was littered with versions of this, and it was not now, not ever. And then at the last minute, I'm like, uh-uh, you know. And I often, you know how teachers tell you that um, when they're teaching you proper English grammar that a double negative is actually a positive, which of course is absolute nonsense. Because if someone says not never, we know exactly what they mean, right? Yeah. If someone uses it, there's nothing unclear. <laughs> it, there's nothing that makes it a positive, right? And they are these guttural figures. And I thought that it gave the right tone to these guys and the right threat. And I think even that word never, you know, um, especially coming at the beginning of a novel like that, shadows, you know, over the rest of the story because it really is not until 600 pages later that that marriage actually happens. So I, I just felt more powerful to me to use that and it felt truer to the characters. And again, I like the way it sounded, you know, so. So it was also a social commentary that the character was, of a, more of a peasant than uh, Absolutely. An uneducated, etc. Okay, Absolutely. Yeah. And Michael, uh, following up, um, you notice that the the language spoken by the character is more varied at the lower social classes. Yeah. The more you raise in society, the more you go to the aristocracy or the high bourgeoisie, the more they speak the same standard language. Yeah. Diversity is with the peasants, it, with, with the workers. And, and also, there's silences. I think one of um, my favorite chapters is chapter 19, where you have suddenly two very powerful figures of society meeting. You have the, the Conte Zio, the yeah. uncle of Don Rodrigo, who has been called in to get this pesky priest out of the way, Padre Cristoforo, who's the good guy, trying to save Lucia. And they want to get him out of the way. So what does he do? He calls in the provincial father of the Capuchin order, who's, you know, Cristoforo's boss, basically. Has a big dinner in his honor, makes it all look very nice, and then brings him to the side into his study. And between the lines, there's this deep threat that's being voiced and not voiced. There, I have to say, my experiences with Italian diplomacy were invaluable. <laughs> <laughs> so more the Italian diplomats than the nuns. Absolutely. The nuns told you what you did. Well, no, when the nuns slapped you and I said, I didn't do it, that's for all the times that I didn't catch you, they would say. Um, <laughs> they were quite explicit. But, but not the silence. No, not the silence. Oh, well, the silent treatment, that's another thing entirely. But I mean, I was working at the desk of a top diplomat for years and, and in the way that uh, powerful Italian men will do, rather than keep you outside of the office, they want you in there while they make their phone calls. I don't understand. Um, and so I would hear these odd discussions and the, you know, just the way that you would never make an explicit threat, but just, you know, sort of slip in there the idea, the insinuation of what might happen if this person did not get their way. So it's a fantastic scene, but it really is built around what's unsaid, you know. Absolutely. Do we have more questions? Yes. Just wait for the microphone just one second. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Michael, you mentioned the editor. How much did they interfere with your work? <laughs> I, I hope they're not in the room. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think when you translate, first of all, editors, editors play an indispensable role um, because you can get so attached to the Italian and to making sure your English mirrors that that you're not really fully grasping how it looks in English. How, and first of all, over the course of my career, uh, editors used to be older than me. <laughs> you know, doesn't happen anymore, you know? Um, <laughs> and they used to have this big fat, you know, Webster's Third Dictionary next to their desk and they'd look things up. So actually when I worked at the Italian mission, I had that dictionary like it's my Bible and like, well, let's see what Webster has to say, you know? Um, and now they're younger and uh, my editors on this had not worked with translation before, so their uh, editing practice was to say, oh, this character needs more development, or there's a digression here. And so, you know, I had some very heavy-handed editing, 
which I tried to deal with, and then I had to reject the first round of edits because I felt like I was having to excavate my own translation from, because I don't know if you've seen e-editing, it's terrible stuff where you know people will just, maybe there'll be one little change in a paragraph, but then suddenly the whole paragraph is X'd out, and then some little comment box off to the side. I had to buy a larger screen and everything so that I could see what was going on. <laughs> so it was really, it was excruciating. Um, but, you know, she, and I had to also resist my own uh, sarcastic impulses because, you know, you get these dumb questions, you know, in the boxes, and I would tr say, that's a dumb question, or like, duh, look it up. Um, <laughs> and so I did have to go back and erase all of that because, and of course, we are a team, and, you know, in Italy, you, <laughs> you learn to work together, right? I mean, Please. we're all in the same, and we're all fine. We're all fine now, but, um, uh, but it was tough. Um, one of the things that really helped, though, I was called to talk to a class about Manzoni, and it was when we were all doing online stuff. And so the younger editor was present. And one of the students actually asked the editor what it was like to edit a translation. First of all, the editor heard of the importance of the book from someone besides me for the first time. And then she got this question, and she said, I'd never done a translation before. Mm -hmm. And so when we sort of had a celebratory dinner recently, they just said that they had learned so much from me about editing. <laughs> so um, it, is, it is tough. You need the editors. Uh, you don't want to be, if I get very light editing, I'm very worried. I've had heavy editing. I've had weird editing where once I translated as gelato as ice cream because this was a real crappy town. Could have been where I grew up. Um, and the kids were having frozen pizza and not gelato, right? In crappy towns, you don't have gelato, you have ice cream. And she changed all of my ice creams to gelatos. <laughs> and all of my misters to signores. And it's, you know, I mean, it can be well-meaning. You need that intervention. You need another pair of eyes and stuff like that. But it, it's all a balancing act. So it, 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 it is important, uh, but it's, there's too much and there's too little, you know? What happened to the gelato? Did they... Uh, no, I, I brought it back to okay. ice cream. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, back there. I, I was just, um, I was thinking, I, re I read it a few years ago, um, so I don't remember a lot, uh, but, but as soon as I saw the book and, and that you were doing this, I. I remember that the nun was absolutely my favorite character, and I would th I would think that um, I I shouldn't speak for anyone but myself, but I would think that a lot of present day women could identify with her, even even though they're even if they're not in a, you know being forced into the convent, but that that this is something that women could find some aspect of, you know, um, always every place, you know, which I th I think is partly why I I mean I don't see why it hasn't been more more red here, because <laughs> I was really having fun with it, you know, um, however good the translation was. Um, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to, um, I mean, I, j I love that digression. It's like, here she is with a nun. Oh, by the way, <laughs> this is this horrible, horrible story, you know. But then um, when, when lockdown happened in 2020, and everyone was saying, read Manzoni, you know, um, read, read the, the betroth. Um, because this is what's what's happening right now. Do what do you, what do you think about that? About how it's yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, two part answer. Uh, because in terms of the nun, I knew someone like that. First yeah. of all, you know, when I talk about uh, trying to bring my own reality into this, you know, to make to be close to what I'm describing, I was in a boarding house in in Germany. I was learning German, and um, it was in Munich, and that's where they had the International Youth Library. And this professor, an American professor, was there to study children's literature. And very nice woman, you know, we talked a lot. And then one night she says to me, is there anything that you've noticed about me? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, I feel like I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> and, and, and so I said, well, I said, you know, you talk a lot. I said, but there's like 10 years of your life that are missing. And she said, I used to be a nun. And she talked about how she became a nun youngest daughter of the family, and from a very early age, they instilled that idea in her head. You know, going with her older mother, because you know, one child, sh you should have a large family, right? And one child should be a nun or a priest, who I think is gonna keep the bench warm up in heaven, you know, just like, <laughs> let her in, you know. Um, 
And she described the whole process and how when suddenly, you know, she wanted to leave because her best friend left. And she was not allowed to be best friends. I mean, there were very rigid rules. Uh, she was not allowed to, she had wanted to study English, they wanted to make her study math because they needed math teachers. And so when her best friend left, that lit a light bulb in her and she realized she could leave. And when she was ready to leave, her brothers and sisters were all ready for her because they knew this would happen. And she cried and cried. And they took her to a mall, to a women's shop, and she got a dress, and the moment she saw herself in a dress, she stopped crying. Mm. And, and I thought of her so much when I was you know, translating this part. Um, the second part of the pandemic, I was done, I had done revisions, and then suddenly you know, this happened, and I knew that the novel took on a new relevance. I mean, the Italian newspapers were all quoting chapters 31 and 32, the very beginning of 32, you know, the plague they all had feared would enter, enter it with the German troops when the imperial troops came in for this war going on in Mantua and they brought with them the plague. And so much of what was, it's not fiction at all, and in fact Manzoni was criticized by Goethe for this part of the novel for not being invention, not being poetry and being too historical. Um, instead it's a remarkable uh, portrait of what, not just of what was happening then, but a clear portrait, better than anyone else, than Camus, than Defoe, mm -hmm. than any of the people that have talked about plague, a much clearer portrait of the sort of political uh, and social climate uh, that we have experienced, you know. Um, the social, uh, certain words than I was hearing on the radio. Um, there are episodes of, you know, Renzo enters Milan and people are saying, stay away, stay away, don't get too close. There's isolation. There's when he returns from Milan and he goes to see his future mother-in-law and he says, let's not get too close, I'm covered with the plague he had recovered, and we'll just sit in benches opposite each other. So you could really feel it on your skin, I mm -hmm. think, as I was, and I had to go back and look at those chapters again because there was nothing at all remote about them. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm so curious if in the course of your translation, how your conception of Manzoni as a person uh, changed, you know, his preoccupations, his thinking behind the sentences, and whether or not you felt in conversation with that or just how your sense of, yeah, the person behind the book uh, evolved. Yeah, one, one of the things I did just to, you know, you, you try to stay close to the text. I wanted to use a very modern English. I didn't want it to be old fashioned. And when Manzoni jumps out and makes comments in the course of the book, he, uses, he says, we, noi. And I changed that to I. And that made his voice come out. And it also made him more real to me, in a way. And I, there's many Manzonis. The Manzoni that I studied in graduate school um, is not a very interesting person. You have to read all these essays. You know, um, There's a heaviness to him. There's the portraits of him. And there is a fact that he's sort of monumental you know, and, and in the pantheon. Um, and I think in the course of the novel, I just saw him as a much more playful figure. There's a moment when he talks about his son playing with guinea pigs and trying to herd them. It's sort of like herding cats. And so there's this playfulness to him, but the playfulness of a very shy man. You know? um, so as much as he was honored by Italian society, he was uh, very asocial, I think, in a way. You know? Very lonely. He had a very lonely life, yeah. uh, marked by pain and, and, yeah, outlived and loss. Most, outlived most of his children. His children acquired debts as children of wealthy families tend to do, you know. Um, yeah, I, it's a sad life, um, but, and he loved the solitude of the countryside, you know. Um. And with Michael, we were saying that there is this a beautiful book by Natalia Ginsburg, uh, La Famiglia Manzoni, that actually is a compilation of records from correspondence mostly and other sources, and she puts it all together. And it really gives you the idea of these. Uh the mother, you think of the mother, Giulia Beccaria, you know, um, who was the daughter of Cesare Beccaria, who's very, even well known today for having written the first treatise against capital punishment, you know, which was famous in France and in London. I think it's very difficult to even trace the original. A friend of mine translated it, and to find what was the original, you know, that I should translate was difficult. Um, and she 
supposedly his father, his natural father, was one of the Veris, who I'd mentioned before was this prominent um, Milanese family and uh, intellectuals, and again, militant against uh, the penal system of Italy at the time. Um, and instead, you know, since uh, uh, she uh, was forced to marry in this older guy, you know, Pietro Manzoni, she was pregnant, you know, they thought it was a convenient marriage, he was noble. He lived with his seven unmarried sisters, including one former nun, right, um, in a dark, miserable house on the Naviglio, you know, um, and spent most of his childhood in boarding schools, you know, outside of home. So no motherly love until, you know, as an adult, he went to Paris and sort of reconciled with her. And through religion, in a way, found his family. And I think that's something to be said about religion, not so much as a belief in God, but as a way of connecting with other people. Did they convert together? Yes. yes. Which is the such mother, a uh, Alessandro, and his wife. Yeah, yeah. Because his first wife was Calvinist. They talk about that. And he was, you know, Italians never, I don't know why they don't like to say they're atheists. It's, it's always puzzled me, you know. Um, or even agnostic, for that matter. They'll just say non credente. <laughs> um, whatever, right? Um, but um, it's, he's sort of hard to, you know, he did study with the Somaski priest or something. Yes. Who I have no idea who they were. Um, because we don't have that order here, I don't It's think. a counter-reformation order yeah. dedicated to teaching. Yeah. And, and from that, he became very anti-clerical. He hated yes, these boarding yeah. schools. It he reminds hated. me, one of the researches I was doing for that chapter I mentioned about the provincial father, you know, and I was like, it was a padre provinciale. I'm like, well, what do I call him in English? And I say, well, maybe the provincial superior or something. And then I said, well, let me find a Capuchin. So I looked around, and it turns out there was an order of Capuchins uh, in Delaware, and they said, oh, you must talk to Father Cyprian. I'm like, okay. And they put him on the phone, and he knew Italian, and he knew the novel. And I said, well, you know, what if I call him the Father Superior? He, he says, St. Francis would never have used a hierarchical word like that. You know? And it was, it was like such a shock and so bracing in a way to sort of be reminded of who the Capuchins were and who these orders were. And it was against this whole idea of one person being above another. Um, but it very... I talk about my religious background um, as, um, for us, it was a sense of community. We were raised um, Second Vatican Council and the belief in the social gospel and helping others, um, you know, building a community. And I think in America, with such a mobile population, my parents were from Pennsylvania and Ohio, and you moved into, in, into a Massachusetts, not the friendliest place in the world. I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> But if, if you were going to find a community, it, re it really was through your church. You know? um, so apart from beliefs and scandals and all the rest, uh, it has that very important function. You know? But not even religion sort of sweetened his life or provided like... Uh, no, even, uh, even, even in Catholicism, he was so severe, I think, in, in his in the Jansenism, which I'm <coughs> struggling to understand, you know, um, like I said, because of my difficulties with philosophy, but he sort of combined the Calvinism of his wife with his conversion, and the conversion through instruction, very severe instruction, you know, with the priest who was also of that same, when we say Jansenist, I, I basically translate it as a kind of very puritanical version of Catholicism, and very different from the way Catholicism is practiced in Italy, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Much less joyous, you know. Um, and it's a cut through, yeah. good on one side, bad yeah. on the other side. No candy for Easter, no. you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> Candies are always bad. <laughs> yes? I was just wondering, uh, what was your relationship with previous translations when you approached uh, the work? Like, did you ever get stuck at a certain moment and, and try to see how other translators had done that same passage yeah. or? Absolutely. Uh, I had the two previous translations, one by Archibald Calhoun, uh, which had, had then been revised by um, uh, the professor who's here, what's his name, David Forgesh, you know, had done a revision. So I knew that it was accurate, you know, um, and um, it was very, very faithful, well, almost too much so, you know. Um, I could feel that tension. And then there was a Bruce Penman, which is a peng Penguin edition. And I did look at them, um, mostly at the end, because if I thought that my interpretation had veered too far from what they had done, then I went back to the Italian, you know. Um, 
So, and I, I didn't want to copy them, of course, because there, there is that danger when you're sort of looking at someone else. But I definitely consulted them, and I, I think you, I've always done that when I've done a retranslation. It's very helpful. But then you realize that the things that give you trouble gave them trouble. So, you, you know, you have to find a solution, you know. I have a general question following up to this. What are we going to do with, with uh, classics in translation? Do they have an expiration date and we need to provide a new translation? How often should that happen? It's funny. I mean, there are certain, um, yeah, I, I don't know why, um, but translations tend to age uh, faster than the, and the original stays ageless. Um, uh, you know, we're figuring, we're giving this a 20 year life maybe. Um, Only? Yeah, uh, well, you know, maybe it'll be 50 years. I mean, I feel like I've given uh, Amer English readers something that they can read and enjoy, you know? I think, and you don't do it neutrally, you know? If you, you do, I, there's certain things that I put into evidence more than others, because if, it was, if I didn't do that, it would just be flat. I would say it would end up like wallpaper, you know? Um, so there might be parts that struck me more, that I might have played up more, um, that someone else might do. So I would be happy to see new approaches, but um, there's been retranslations of the Odyssey. I think there's been a very important new translation by Emily Lee Wilson, where uh, as a woman going into it and, and as a scholar, she's identifying really gender prejudices that the earlier male translators brought to bear on it. For example, we talked earlier about, you know that awful moment at the end of the Odyssey when, to, when Odysseus orders Telemachus to massacre the slave girls, and they weren't always called slave girls. They were called the maids by some, they were called wanton women, as if somehow they were guilty when basically they'd been raped by the suitors and then Telemachus goes in to massacre them. And as a translator, you do feel protective of a text. You feel like you wanna be diplomatic in a way. Previous translators somehow justified that in their approach and she didn't, she didn't. That's an example, I think, there's other things which, uh, when we look at American and British editing practices, certain things were considered too racy. And of course, you know, when I did Moravia, he was kind of racy, and I put the raciness back in. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's sort of there. So I think, um, I, you know, I think that somehow, you know, well, philology, right? That's what Italian is all about. But our <coughs> translations bear the mark of the time in which they were done. You know? And then as time changed, look at how much is changing in publishing today how much the canonical, uh, you asked me earlier, like is there a comparable work in English or in American schools to this, the way every Italian school child will read this and see it as exemplary, whether they like it or not. I cannot think of a single example. Uh, we just had Banned Books Week and there was a picture I think on Twitter of a series of banned books and someone said, how many of these books have you read? Every single one of them was a book that I had assigned to me in high school, it was sort of astonishing. Catcher in the Rye, for example, Huckleberry Finn, who you can't read that anymore, right? Um, and there's a list is long, so uh, we don't have a unifying text here. So, um, uh, so I think the Italian, um, uh, one of the things that encourages me that's kind of funny, a boomerang effect, uh, the Italian press is very excited by this. And I hear that a lot of Italians are picking it up and reading it as adults now, you know, free from because there was this very kind of spicy article that Johnny Riotta did yeah. where he talking about how I use uh, Scarface, Scarface for one character, and but sort of showing the color that's in the novel that people might not have observed. Uh. Michael, you had received really raving reviews from, um, what was the thing that you did not expect and, and that you find in these reviews? I, first of all, it's great that they're by non-Italians. Um, uh, John Accocello is Italian, I guess, but. It's just, first of all, I feel like I won a bet, you know, because I always said it's been badly translated. If it's decently translated, people will like it. It's seeing the book appreciated by non-Italians, you know, who don't have that connection to it and who get it. All three reviews that I've seen really get it in a way that I don't, I haven't seen Italians grasp it to quite the same degree. They acknowledge the parts that are problematic, the digressions and the, the plot kind of, you know, meandering a little bit, but they get it. You know, um, and I'm really, really gratified by that. They, they really, and they seem to understand all of them, mm -hmm. the centrality of this work to understand the Italian national character, maybe yeah. that there is one. Yes. And I think that th that's a great tribute to your work. Yeah. Because of course they all praised your language and the, your, your, your mastery of the language and the way in which you convey 
in contemporary spoken yeah. American mm -hmm. English, uh, the Italian of the 19th century, but they all get the centrality of the book. Yeah. So they do not only appreciate your technique and your language, but they also seem to have understood the importance of this book. And I think ultimately that was your, 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 your ultimate and also, goal. Uh, and there is an element of campanalismo perhaps in that, you know, because it, when you're dealing with American publishing and when I was involved for many years with translation committees and giving grants, uh, prizes, the French and the Germans always took it all, right? And, and Italy was sort of left out, except for Dante, right? Don't touch Dante, right? And I'm like, well, what the heck, you know? I mean, Italy isn't some bywater, you know? This was, this was the treasury of Europe. France, the French language, French literature, English literature, so much is owed to Italy, um, you know, in the, from the early modern age on. And it was Joan Acocella in the, it, it comes out next week, I think, but she said, if you care about the 19th century, you have to read this book. And I was like, yay, because <laughs> who talks about the Italian 19th century? Who reads anything? Maybe, maybe, you know, Leopardi? Apart from that, it's just a blank. And recently. Yeah. The recent yeah. Other than that, it's just a blank in uh, European literary history, you know? So I'm really, I feel like I really, Hopefully, well, you did yeah. it. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. And I think we're going we're gonna to ask Demosthenes to, to read this third passage. And I would say that it's one of the best examples of Manzoni poetic uh, prose. Uh, he's more famous for his, his, his novel, but he was also a poet. Um, not quite recognized as a poet. But I think that he's, he's at his best when he writes prose like this, that is poetic in the essence of it, without using uh, rhymes or, or meter, but. And I think that's, I try to do that in the translation. Is, you know, I would see all these parallelisms, the way that he would repeat certain words, the way that he would reverse sentences and stuff, and it was all to capture, a, it's kind of a tone poem in many ways. You know? Do you want to see what exactly? This is, uh, it sort of closes the first part of the novel when the young couple is forced to leave the village because it's too dangerous and a, a kidnapping his attempt has been made on Lucia so with the consultancy of Padre Cristoforo the great hero of the novel they escape and so they're just leaving and this even today maybe not so much today but I think of the years when I lived in Italy between the 70s and the 80s I taught at a mostly all-girl high school and all the girls would say you know um, that when they married they wanted to never be more than 20 kilometers away from mom <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, because they, they could call her for recipes, and and there is, that's, and even today, I think so many Italians who are here would really much rather be in Italy if they could, and here they are, here she is, especially because these are her thoughts, being forced to leave home. Farewell, mountains rising from the waters and reaching to the sky. Jagged peaks familiar to one who has grown up among you etched in her mind no less clearly than the faces of those she holds dear. Farewell rivers, whose roaring she knows as well as the voices of home. Farewell small white villages clinging to the slopes like flocks of gazing sheep, grazing sheep. Nothing could be sadder than the footsteps of one who, having grown up among you, must take her leave such a moment crushes the fantasies of a man who departs freely, dreaming of seeking his fortune elsewhere. Dismayed to have ever resolved such a thing, he would turn back but for the thought of one day returning a wealthy man. The more he advances across the plain, the more his weary eyes are repelled by the unending sameness. The air feels heavy and dead. Dejected and confused, he enters the tumultuous city, unable to breathe amid house after house, street after street. Standing before buildings admired by many a foreigner, he thinks with restless desire of the fields of the fields in his home village the little house that caught his eye long ago. 
which he will buy once he returns to his mountains. A wealthy man. But what about a girl who has never nursed even a fleeting desire to leave the mountains, who had pictured her future in that setting, only to be cast out by a perverse force, torn in a single moment from her most cherished habits and fondest hopes? She leaves the mountains behind to follow in the footsteps of strangers, strangers she had no wish to meet, unable to even imagine the moment when she might return. Farewell, childhood home, when lost in private thought, she had learned to hear the difference between normal footsteps and the footsteps of the youth she awaited with a mysterious fear. Farewell home she might never know, at which she had stolen many a blushing glance, the home where she had envisioned a married life, serene and lifelong. Farewell church, where peace of mind had so often returned while singing the Lord's praises, where her marriage bands had been posted and the mass prepared, where the secret yearning of her heart was supposed to be solemnly blessed and love ordained and made holy. Farewell. He who gave you such bliss is everywhere and would never trouble the joy of his children except to make it more certain and great. Such was the nature, though not the letter of Lucia's thoughts, which differed only slightly from those of her two fellow pilgrims as the boat brought them closer to the right banks of the Adda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again very much, Demosin, for bringing alive Manzoni's word in Michael's translation. Um, before we go upstairs for a drink and celebrate, uh, I would like to call to the, uh, to the stage photographer Mike Slack and the curator of the exhibit, Gaia Gianni. Grazie. And in the meantime, maybe Michael can tell us a few words about the genesis of this exhibit. Prego. I'll be very brief because I think I've talked too much. <laughs> I can hear my own family telling me to shut up in the background. Um, but Mike and I met, uh, I think it was through you, Gaia, and through another, and through Joya, where it's Sony, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I guess it was, and he was going to Milan in the midst of the pandemic. I'm like, holy cow. Um, and he had heard about my translation and wanted to see it. I think you were my first reader, actually. I was just in that, too. I was yeah. one of the first people to read this new translation. Yeah, yeah, you were seeing it printed out and probably yeah. before, like, a, another two or three I, rounds. I hope, uh, I, have, I hope I haven't embarrassed you by uh, including in the show a photograph from one of your notebooks that you Not at all. I'm, I'm, really happy about <laughs> I'm really happy about that, because, I mean, I, I have to give a talk to an academic setting in about a week, and I realized, you know what, I'm just going to show them the mutation of my text, you know, because yeah. what I, what Mike did is he, you know, he looked at the text, read it, um, went to Milano during a time when even Italians were not allowed to visit their neighbors or their families, and photographed what was going on, but using the novel maybe as a kind of skeleton, maybe as a kind of itinerary of sorts, uh, and to me it's extraordinary, I'm so happy about it, I'm happy we're here together, uh, because I sort of believe in the infinity of translation, you know. Manzoni was translating himself over this 20-year period. Yeah. Um, he's been translated many times. I, I ha I'm pretty happy with what I've done, but I know that I could go back in five years and redo it again, and you have translated it now, you know. Well, yeah, I'm glad that uh, this show is happening con concurrently with this conversation about translation, because that's really the idea of um, mutation became really a central uh, part of how I was thinking about editing the pictures I'd made and even while I was, uh, you know, reading the, re I, I read an early translation and then I read, you know, you were sending me like updates and, uh, but the novel itself is framed as a translation. As you mentioned earlier, he, uh, Manzoni or the narrator of the novel is, he stops two pages in and says, you know, I, 
I'm trying to copy this story directly and I can't do it. And he switches to his own voice. And I feel like as a photographer, that's kind of what I do. I can't copy the world. I can only <coughs> somehow turn it into my own voice. So that, that was a way into it. Um, and this idea of how Manzoni was, he, he wrote the novel three times and was uh, self-translating basically like over the course of the thing. So, um, so my, my pictures were in no way like a, an illustration or I wasn't trying to tell the story. I was just trying to uh, um, sort of be under the influence of the novel and also Manzoni's own interests in, in botany and geology and uh, just the way he thought about and wrote about the world. And I tend to focus on, uh, as a photographer, the kind of the stuff between the stuff, the things that aren't really things and the the stuff that holds everything together. So that's where some of the quotes that I've pulled that are on the, that are kind of uh, on the walls throughout or on the pillars throughout the show, um, they're not really the main narrative uh, uh, plot points, but they're these little interstitial moments that I felt like uh, gave me as a photographer a way into uh, using this book to make pictures. And, and I think Gaia, you were the one, you were like. Um, the marriage count. I mean, you brought us together. You <laughs> I can't even think of the, the name, but the, the Yenta, the or the you brought it, you know, you <laughs> said you had the idea of putting yeah, it Yes, I was like, um, as uh, I arrived like from documentary and development of project, uh, and uh, during uh, the pandemic, uh, so we were talking about inviting uh, Mike uh, to have a walk. Uh, in Milan, uh, and then uh, we thought, uh, why not using uh, the Promessi Sposi? I don't pronounce uh, in English. And, um, and so then doing research, uh, that is one uh, of my main uh, um, attitude. So I discover uh, like a clip or some uh, article that you were doing uh, a new translation, and they say, "Wow, that's uh, <laughs> that's we are on the spot." Uh, and uh, so another ability that I have is like, "Oh, how can I connect him?" And so I have this good um, this friend, uh, Gioia Guerzoni, that is a very good uh, translator from English to Italian. And so I, th I thought she for sure know him, and that was uh, the thing. And so I wrote uh, to Michael and explained the project uh, and say, oh, let's put uh, them together. And so then, uh, mm, so, uh, so as uh, they told, uh, he gave us uh, the, uh, the preview of the translation so that uh, Mike uh, could enter um, with a different book of uh, the Penguin edition uh, and made it live. And sometimes when we were like driving, he was reading some pieces uh, of the translation that actually I really loved uh, in English. <laughs> and, um, and so that, uh, that was uh, the main, and they, all the time, uh, um, so confront and also each other. And then uh, when, before coming in May, in one of the other session, because mainly it was like uh, three, four sessions during the season, uh, so you met uh, actually, and so he could also go through your notebook. Uh, and uh, what I have to say, at a certain point, uh, as um, as American photographer, he was a little bit like, oh, but no one knows Manzoni. I uh, should also a little bit get rid of him and, uh, and say, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's the, also the point, uh, and everything, the idea started from that. So I want, like, uh, the manuscript. Uh, I want, like, uh, my, uh, Michael Moore translation uh, notebook uh, and uh, some other, also if uh, he's always Always free and free association, a psychic guide uh, for from um, the promises posi. Then uh, I think uh, that sometimes uh, um, there has to be like reference; they are hidden, uh, and one has to read uh, uh, the, <laughs> the novel and to find them out. Uh, and anyway, all the exhibition. Uh, is um, is always related uh, to or Manzoni interest uh, or to the spot or the itinerary that uh, Renzo did uh, in Milan in North Italy. Then maybe it was like uh, aside, uh, beside uh, what was the ra the real spot in the novel, but it is. There's some docu. There's uh, I just never I never take a documentary kind of approach to anything, but there's definitely a few pictures in the show that are very specific uh, very specific to locations in the novel that we were, you know we used as destinations but then Renzo himself uh, tends to meander 
the novel had, uh, I, when I first read about the, the novel, I refreshed my memory and looked it up on Wikipedia. One of the lines that jumped out at me was that it, uh, it's notable for its depiction of the meandering of the human mind. And I think that's the, the line that, that uh, turned me on to using this as a, you know, as a potential to, to make a body of work. And Renzo himself, like, as I was saying, like, uh, his path is very, you know, he spends, that, that, uh, it, you said uh, uh, he is the most, you think, the most American character, and I, I hadn't thought about that before, but perhaps that's why I fixated on his journey <laughs> through the novel. <laughs> <laughs> he's impulsive, he's passionate, he gets embroiled in things, whether he's meaning to or not, and uh, so he, it was mainly his path that I was kind of following. Uh, yeah. Sort of like this negative example for Italian children. It's yeah. like Pinocchio, right? Yeah. You know, I mean... But who doesn't involved like in things that he doesn't need to get involved in and creates problems for himself. Just wait then, a little yeah. bit longer to get into the monastery, you'll yeah. be fine, right? right? Then there wouldn't be a novel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Michael, do you want to quote his eight quotes? No, it's just that it's funny. I, uh, I started a Twitter account just, you know, just having a sentence here and there in English and then in Italian. And, and it's just people are responding from all over. And I got a picture today of someone with this huge bench right by the Adda River, mm. you know, and with a quote from Manzoni. And as we were talking about nature and about Renzo meandering, there's this beautiful moment when he escapes from Milan for the first time, and, and he's like walking, he's avoiding, he's, there's a warrant out for his arrest, he's terrified, he doesn't want to stay on the main road. Um, and then he, you know, he, he's just terrified. Um, and there's this moment um, when he discovers the Ada. All at once, that dread, the undivined horror that his spirit had been fighting for hours seemed to overwhelm him. He was on the verge of losing his mind, but frightened most of all by his own fear. He mustered his former courage and commanded it to resist. His composure briefly restored, he paused for a moment of reflection. He resolved to get out of there immediately, retrace his steps, and go straight back to the last village he had passed, return to the company of men, and seek shelter, even at the tavern. As he stood still, no longer crushing the leaves underfoot, everything around him fell silent. He started to hear a sound, a murmuring, the murmuring of running water. He listened more carefully. There was no mistaking it. It's the Ada, he exclaimed. This was a great evening and it's not over. So we have much to celebrate. And as the beginning of our Manzone de, the Manzoni Moore Marathon, we couldn't be more happy to celebrate Michael Moore's translation of the betrothed into English and the translation into images that Mike Slack and Gaia Gianni provided with the exhibit. Please join us upstairs for a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs>